say someone recorded this sound. So does that mean they own it if I go? Digital samplers allow you to take a snatch of a record, sound or anything like that, and turn that into a building block for a song. We grabbed conga sounds, trumpet sounds, violin sounds, drum beat sounds, and re-manipulated and created our own music. If you sample one note of a sound recording, it's copyright infringement. <laughs> You can't just have a, a record that's made up of everybody else's records and then not pay them for it. You pay for a guitar, you pay for a piano, you pay for anything else that you make a song with. By ignoring the rules, they came up with a whole new way of thinking about music. It's actually taking sounds and meshing them together and putting them all in time to come up with something totally different. At the end of the day, the court said, not only is this copyright infringement, but we see criminal prosecution in line for this one. We never anticipated, like, getting someone to pay for James Brown going, <laughs> and that's it. I didn't even know what sampling was, and I didn't know how, uh, anything about it until people say, You're, you, they're sampling your drums. We live in a remix culture now, and the laws have to change to be able to help that culture do what it has to do. We're here in this in, in this record store, and in, in a lot of ways, it's a repository. It's an archive of what's come before. I mean, records, literally, their name, records, right? You're encoding history into these grooves, right? So DJs, by taking these records and playing them back, are giving us snatches of our history. They're giving a reinterpretation of that history to us um, in the present day. For me, the most definitive sound in hip hop is like, the sound of, of, of a needle skipping over a scratchy record, like the sampled sound. A good appropriated sample, it has a good quality of, of its own, and it has a strong reference that evokes cultural resonance as well. In sampling the way it's conventionally used, you are supposed to be able to understand what you're listening to. And that's because what you're listening to has its own qualities, its own importance. That's what's cool about sampling, that it transports the listener, if they're willing to move in that pathway, back to a specific action. So it's sort of like an archive of memories of, of real experiences. archaeology, audio archaeology that are happening, and you can dig down to find out where your actual thing originated. on the traditional side was this is a, a very lazy way of, of songwriting and, and, and making records. I've made records with a lot of people. Um, probably the most famous would be Nirvana, the Pixies, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin. As a creative tool, like for someone to use a sample of an existing piece of music to 
and then it, for their music, I think I think it's an extraordinarily lazy artistic choice. It's much easier to take something that is already awesome and play it again uh, with your name on it. <laughs> It's sort of like, like a bad dance move or something like that. You 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 think the people doing it should be embarrassed for behaving this way, you know? Or you you think the people doing it should be self-aware enough to understand that what they're doing is cheap and 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 easy, and everyone else can tell that it's cheap and easy. Rock and roll was lazy, you know. Three chord, blue, you know. Everybody would look down on basic rock and roll when the people like said, "That's not music." Bop bop and loom and. The argument that a sampler is no different from any other instrument is absurd. It's absurd because no other instrument allows you simply and easily to take someone else's life's work and put your name on it. Perhaps it's a little easier to take a piece of music than it is to learn how to play a guitar or something. True, just like it's probably easier to snap a picture with that camera than it is to uh, actually paint a picture. But what the photographer is to the painter is what the modern producer and DJ and computer musician is to the instrumentalist. turntable is the newest instrument. The turntables are more rhythmically complex than any other instrument based on the fact that no, what you can do with a fader and your hand playing at the same time, no guitar player or a horn player could play that fast. <laughs> Okay, so this is like uh, like how the record would sound normally. Right. So then, to I guess to destroy it, you would. Uh... Basically, when I'm sampling, I have all these artists. They're in my band. And I'm sampling Wes Montgomery to play guitar on much. He's in my band. You know, I got Art Blakey. He's my drummer. That's tight. You know what I'm saying? I got all these legendary musicians that are in my band. People who are suing or don't understand what, what's so great about um, sample-based music really need to like see it happen over the course of a year. It's not, you don't just go to a store, grab one record, put it down, sample it, bang it out, and that's it. You know, like there's a process. Always buying records, searching, searching, and like sometimes we find, the, oh, Silver Apple, you know, records or something like that, and this in one um, very short part, that bass line. And essentially what, what they were all doing is they were beat miners, you know what I mean? They were like mining old records for those break sections, like basically 70s funk records. George Clinton is a major, major funk icon. He's the maverick. He's the person that, through Parliament and Funkadelic and his own works later on, created a lot of the foundation for what hip hop would become. Funk is the 
DNA in hip hop. You know, so they were less EQ than most records, so it left a lot of room for the samplers to put their own sound to it. I don't think they thought of it like that, but it just that raw sound seemed to appeal to them. You know, the, the drums and guitar. A lot of records back in time has a really good sound, like James Brown. The beats are just so fat. James Brown's music was so useful, I think, to a lot of hip hop heads because Clyde Stubblefield's the epitome of the funk. When I sat down, I just started playing a beat, something simple, and everybody joined in. And then Brown came in and put the lyrics to it, and it was called Funky Drummer. Next thing I know, all the rap artists was using it to uh, the sample it. I went, okay, why didn't they choose something else like uh, Cold Sweat or uh, I Got the Feeling or something, you know, but they chose that. So. <laughs> what you're looking for is any two bar or one bar snatch that that uh, of of a drum beat that's 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 funky enough that that keeps some sort of a groove so that could be anywhere so you're looking for breaks from any record you know whether it's Sly Stone Herman Kelly in Life you know whether it's something that's in a Cool in the Gang record as long as it was two bars it was just enough for a DJ to catch it let it flow Sampling came out of the DJ culture. You would have a drum beat, and then we would scratch a horn hit on top of the drum beat. a culture of borrow and take because it was a culture of, of uh, that that was founded upon a lack of resources the idea of not having any instruments but having a turntable and saying well fine this is my instrument you know and you see it now with people with overturned buckets and pots and pans we saw it then what sampling technology did was it basically mimicked exactly what the process was for uh, what the DJs were doing in the parks and the community centers and the nightclubs. Well, these are the breaks. Break it up, break it up, break it up. Down. When you really start hearing digital sampling in hip hop is around the mid 80s, 86 and 87. Well, the second half of the 80s, uh, the freedoms of sampling came with the, with the advent of technology companies that put together equipment. When they got cheaper, basically because a lot more people were able to use them, and that in combination with some of the other factors gave rise to um, an explosion of new music, and new ways of making music, and new music. The golden age of hip hop was really defined by some seminal albums. De La Soul with Three Feet High and Rising, P Rock a little bit later with you know Mecca and the Soul Brother, uh, Tribe Called Quest, you know Midnight Marauders, the Eric B's, Rakim, Karis Ones. Um, it's the 80s golden age of rap. I think very deeply. 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 I think very dee
like instructions to a game. See, I'm not insane. In fact, I'm kind of rational. rational. When I'm asking you who's more dramatic, is this one or that one? The white one or the black one? Pack the puck and I'll jump up to a tank one. Take this one. It's just the guy with the crew. Right up to your face and diss you. Well, back then, the sample police didn't roll as thick as they do today. I mean, look at the Paul's Boutique record. That was sample mastery right there. But uh, you put something out like that these days, and um, you get lawyers calling you, and whole bunch of bullshit that goes with that. Public Enemy were iconoclastic, definitely. You never really heard anything like that before. Like, when you hear it for the first time, back then, you know, it's just like, whoa. Here it is, bam, in your face, damn, this is a dope jam. The Bomb Squad was the association of Chuck D, Hank Shockley, Keith Shockley and Eric Vietnam Sabba. Those four individuals together were the Bomb Squad and they were the ones who put together the sound of Public Enemy's music. Yes, the rhythm's a rebel. Without applause, I'm lowering my level. The hard drama, will you never They've worked out um, an unbelievable method in which all of these different people that are in the group are bringing in different types of sounds and they're figuring out how to, to jam with the samples. I want to do some things that were not musical in music. What was my vision was, was to have this, this group be a production assembly line. There's going to be a time when we're going to have a nice little groove where Keith is going to be on some and Chuck is going to have some and I'm going to be like and so we're all together and there's this one little moment that it all just meshes together in a nice vibration and that became the music to Don't Believe the Hype. I'm going to my media assassin, Harry Allen. I gotta ask him. Yo, Harry, you're a writer. Are we that tight? Don't believe the hype. They would take parts, different little small parts, and have a whole 24 track full of samples that equal one a whole arrangement. They did it artsy fartsy, I call it. They made noise sound good the way Jimi Hendrix did with the feedback on the guitar. And they named it perfectly on one of the songs called Bring on the Noise. That's exactly what they did. Bring the noise! Where? My time! Where? Step aside for the first Terminator! What was exciting about Public Enemy was the militancy of it, like the way that Paris and Public Enemy were kind of taking Malcolm X and Black Panther speeches and recordings and sort of reanimating them. Have you forgotten that once we were brought here, we were robbed of our name, robbed of our language. We lost our religion, our culture, our God. And many of us, by the way we act, we even lost our mind. What we wanted to create was that kind of like reality record. You hear it out there on the streets, and now that, that what you heard in the streets is now back in the record again. You know, there's, there was a cultural issue in that it seemed like more or less an underground urban phenomenon. And how is this going to translate to the, you know, to the big record business? And you know, at that time, the big selling artists were Fleetwood Mac and, and uh, Springsteen and things that are more traditional. You could wrap your arms around. 
And it turned out that all the traditional people who were so miffed by this way back in the early days quickly realized there's a huge amount of money to be made here. Look, nobody took hip hop seriously until it started making a lot of money. Do Puff drive Mercedes? Take hits from the 80s? But do it sound so crazy? For me personally, it's nothing personal. I do a work for me, you do a work for you. Well, I think that once people who held music copyrights got wise to how much money hip hop was making, then um, it became kind of a feasting frenzy. So lawyers were getting involved, and there were starting to be these lawsuits over sampling, and there was an awareness that was arising about, hey, hey, they're taking something that doesn't belong to them. D it's mine. I gotta get paid. Boy, now in court, cause I stole a beat. This is a sampling sport, but I'm giving it a new name. What you hear is my P.E. In the early 1990s, there were a series of lawsuits and threats of lawsuits that made it very clear that the lawyers in the entertainment world were going to rein in this practice of unauthorized digital sampling. I think everybody woke up after the De La Soul's Three Feet High and Rising came out and they ended up losing like most of their, um, you know, their percentage of, of copyrights to, uh, I think, the Turtles. For me, I felt like, wow, we're popular now. I'm getting sued by somebody I don't even know. Kind of like, <laughs> oh, oh. You showed me how to do exactly what you do. Qu'est-ce qu'il y a à manger? Les saucisses. So De La Soul was on an independent label called Tommy Boy that put out a lot of very, very important records. The most notable one was, was De La Soul's first album, which had so many samples, I can't even remember how many. And each, for each one, you have to have a, a deal with the publisher and with the master who was holding. You'd have French language records, you'd have the Turtles, you'd have Led Zeppelin, you'd have Holland Oats, you'd have all kinds of, you know, crazy things, you know, coming out of the mix. And it sounded exactly like a lot of people heard pop culture at that particular moment in time. We sampled something of theirs, rightfully so, you know, it didn't get cleared for whatever reason. And Three Feet High and Rising, they told us what, what the samples were on the record and we cleared them all. They didn't tell us about the Turtles one. And that's what usually happens is they, oh, it's not, you know, we changed the speed, it's an unknown song, it's only this amount. Those are the ones that get you at the end. Just something that we did, silliness we played, it was actually a song I put together and well, like I said, once we gave the information to the Tommy Boy and did this, unfortunately, just took it as, well, this is a skit, why should we try to clear this? So, yeah, it happened with us. But I think once it happened to Biz, it really took off. The Biz Marquis sampling case was a case that was brought by a man named Gilbert O'Sullivan, who had a, had a hit song in the 70s called Alone Again Naturally. And it was very ubiquitous. It was a sample. You really could hear the song. It was over and over again looped. So Biz Markey takes this Gilbert O'Sullivan song and makes a parody of it, you know, called Alone Again. And he sings in, he doesn't really sing, he warbles it in his funny Biz Markey type of voice, right? And it's a great joke. Everybody kind of laughs and you play it once and you're like, oh, cool, that's kind of funny and stuff. Gilbert O'Sullivan didn't really think it was that funny, you know? <laughs> you know, it was, it was a pretty uh, aggressive sample. Of, of a song that Mr. O'Sullivan, uh, you know, it was his big hit. So he, had, he was just a no-nonsense guy. He didn't, he didn't want the song in a rap version. So he decides he's going to make an example of this kid and files this huge lawsuit. I'm alone again, naturally. All alone again, naturally. And uh, the judge pronounced it uh, biblically incorrect. Now, how country is that? How, how backwoods is that? You know, that's somebody who totally is like oblivious to the speed of things happening. Shouldn't Bismarcky have an album out by now? 
and you start hearing, oh man, he's going through hell, and then he comes out with an album like a year late, and the album is titled All Samples Cleared. <laughs> you know? Some of those first sampling cases, or those early records, whether it be um, De La Soul, Biz Markey, P.E., and others, it wasn't that they were trying to be thieves or trying not to get caught. It was just like, we kind of didn't know. We always felt like, you know, when you're creating, you create, you know. Whatever you decide that you want to use, you, you, you know, you use to create your own particular vibration your way. And, and, I, and that, to me, was a kind of like an unwritten code within the hip-hop world. We kind of looked at music as, as an assemblage of sounds, and we felt that you couldn't copyright a sound. What y'all think y'all doing bringing us the call for this guy and saying we stealing beats? Y'all can't copyright no beats, man. Y'all judges ain't crazy, man. Once people in the industry got wind of the fact that the courts were not interested in listening to young black men describe their creative processes, they had no tolerance for that. A new industry emerged, the industry of sampling clearances. That meant that groups like Public Enemy could no longer make their powerful sounds in the way they wished to. And record companies are beginning to put more pressure on the artists you know, to disclose the samples from the very, very beginning. I think it was Stakes Is High where it was the first album I recall where we sat down in the beginning of the album. Like the record company made sure like, you know what, let's make sure we speak to our, whoever you want to clear samples. And they went through a list of like, well, George Clinton is in litigation with Westbound, so don't mess with his stuff right now. Uh, George Harrison don't like rap, don't mess with him. Like we actually had a list of people not to touch. Like, when you're going through a rights clearing process, you really need to identify all the different people who own all potential elements of that particular sample or musical element and make sure that they've agreed to what you want to do. And that can be um, very time consuming because there's a lot of people involved in making music. To create requires the permission of somebody else. And it's that transformation which has been radical and recent. Our Copyright Act was basically last rewritten in 1976. So we're operating with a lot of antiquated assumptions about what musical creativity is. It is cheaper, easier, and more predictable if you want to cover somebody's song entirely than if you want to take three seconds of somebody's song. That doesn't make any sense. Why should an entire song be easier and cheaper to do than three seconds of somebody's song? Well, the right to cover any record as long as you don't change the words. You can cover Stairway to Heaven, but if you try to change the words and make it Stairway to Gilligan's Island, which someone tried to do, Led Zeppelin will shut you down in two seconds. The maid was a mighty sailing man, skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. Should an artist be able to say, you can't take my Stairway to Heaven and make it Stairway to Gilligan's Island or, or anything else, or you can't use it on a hip hop record. You know, you can't use, take it out of context for anything else. You can't recontextualize what I've done. It has to stay true to the original. I love Just like you. To relax my mind so I can be free. If I go to somebody and I want to sample a Marvin Gaye lick and I go to Marvin Gaye's estate, I might have to pay, like uh, some people did Eric Sermon, I believe, over $100,000 to sample one song in advance. Let's look at the factors that determine how much it's going to be. Obviously, a factor is going to be what is the economic viability of the work you're sampling? Is it something like the Beatles that is hugely viable in the economic uh, stream? Uh, or is it something that's pretty obscure? Are you taking some R&B song and recording that is lost in the, in the vault and you've, you've brought it back to life? That's a whole nother level. Records like It Takes a Nation of the Moons to hold us back three feet high and rising. They're kind of like artifacts of an earlier time, records that couldn't exist today. They're just legally financially untenable. And them cats is like, man, you know, that's our style. <laughs> you know, like, like now you tell me that my style is too expensive, you know? I think of what, um, 
what started happening in trip hop, you know, with artists like Tricky and Portishead and Bjork, and uh, and what they started doing to their samples. They play a guitar riff, press it up, record it, press it up on vinyl, and sample it off of the vinyl just to have the effect of it being sampled. Our thing about sampling was, you know, there's the confusion element in it because we know we had to be confusing because we didn't want people coming after us. People started to get, started to get pretty savvy about what they were sampling and then how they would mask it. So we would make it a game for you to like try to figure it out. Okay, try to figure out where this came from. You can go all day long and I know you won't find it. They could change the, the, the tone they can change, they got so much technology today, they can, the speed go up or whatever they want to do with it. And I won't even know it's me. <laughs> it is more difficult to make a record than it is to sample it. You know, that's patently obvious. Uh, I guess I'm more concerned with the 20 years or so that got the musician to the point where he could make the record that then is important to the listener because of what in his life has brought him to making that record. I didn't know anything about sampling until people come up and say some, uh, some artist is using your drum pad. I go, cool. I'm Clyde Stubblefield, the original funky drummer, as they say. I joined James Brown Band in 1965, 65, yeah, 65. And uh, I stayed with him until 1970. I played on Give It Up, Turn It Loose, uh, uh, I, I'm Black and I'm Proud, uh, uh, um, Cold Sweat. That's cold sweat. I don't care <laughs> about your past. I just started playing. Doom, pop, do doom, 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 pop, doom, pop, doom, 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 pop, boom, boom, pop, do doom, doom. And the bass player came in, doom, 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 doom. And then the guitar player came in, and the rhythm was there. Well, we, the James came in and heard, said, yeah, I like that. Then he started putting the, I don't care. Da, dum, da. Then they uh, then put the horns in. We had a song. I was, and I started it. <laughs> But we said, OK, cold sweat. Um, that was mine. He didn't give me what, he didn't tell me what to play, uh, asked me to play. I played what I felt, but he owned it, so. So you take a drummer like Clyde Stubblefield, you know, who plays the funky drummer. And James is like, you know, take it, Clyde. And he goes ahead and takes his, his uh, break. Um, and that break ends up becoming, you know, one of the bases for a whole bunch of sample-based records. I never got a thanks. I never got a hello, how are you doing, or anything from any of the rap artists or anything. The only one I got a, a thanks in, from was Melissa, Melissa Etheridge. His name never appears on any of those compositional credits. His name is not part of the legal legacy of all of those great tunes he played on. He doesn't get royalties. He got paid for the time in the studio. The producer or the publisher of that particular track is getting compensated for the use of that sample, but the artist that originally played that drum break that got sampled is not necessarily getting any compensation for it. There's so many groups that sample my stuff. They say I'm the, the world's samplers, number one samplers drummer, so hey, I haven't got a penny for it yet, though, but. <laughs> I 
I can't be sure if that's my drum pattern. If it's a little bit, so a little snap, I can't be sure. But that's where honesty come in. A person could say, yeah, that is your drum pattern. Then we, di we discuss things. Otherwise than that, I cannot go to no one and say, hey, you're using my drum pattern. If it's just a little ta-da-ta, -ta. I don't know that was me, you know. It's real easy to, to look at the big picture and say that the money doesn't always go to the people who do the most creative work. Clyde Stubblefield is still playing out today. You know, he has a regular gig in Madison on Mondays and he goes on tour. He was on tour actually with DJ Cool Herc recently. And you listen to him and he's still got it all. You know, still playing Give It Up, Turn It Loose with all the fire that, she, that he had back in 1971. Oh, my, my music is my life. My music is my breathing. One of the things that sampling has done is that it's revitalized a whole bunch of musicians' careers. At the time that a lot of hip-hop producers started sampling George Clinton, his records weren't available commercially anymore. So hip-hop literally reintroduced the world to George Clinton. It really helped us a lot because it actually, people heard it and got to know who it was and then they wanted to hear the long version of the sample song. James' biggest record was by MC Hammer. You know, I mean, there's many, many examples of, of an original record being outsold by, by the cover um, or the remake that used part of it. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Uh, even Gangsta's Paradise did much more than Pastime Paradise by Stevie Wonder, like 10 times more. And that was Stevie Wonder. Who the hell is Coolio? Men spending most of their lives living in a pastime paradise. So sampling usually is viewed as a musical thing, right? But if you look at the art world, for example, you have Andy Warhol taking photographs and painting them. You have different photographers taking certain scenes and reconstructing them digitally. <laughs> It all implies a layer of collage and pulling together bits and pieces. Fact is, look at how any bit of culture is made. Look at how Shakespeare made culture. Look at how every great poet, how Homer made culture. It's about collage. It's about taking bits and pieces of your influences and, and forging them into something newer and stronger. Think about the way Walt Disney was creative, right? All of Disney's greatest works were taking other people's works and doing something different with them. Pick me up. I've never really heard a completely original musical idea by anyone. Most musicians will say that the best musicians copy. Hey boy, hey boy, hey, hey, what you doing, man? Cut it. Hey, what you doing? What you gonna do? That ain't the piece we supposed to play. Come on. Well, I guess I better get on in here with it. Jazz musicians, when they ad lib, they happen to do a cover of somebody's record, and they went into their ad lib and into their riff. You know, you kind of say that that riff and the ad lib belongs to the musician. Yeah.
Sykes, that's me. Well, all right. You can also look at the blues, and, and for that matter, you can look at anything. I mean, melodies have all, always been borrowed. are an interesting case. I mean, they sort of demonstrate how simple it is to, to make music this way because virtually everyone has made a mashup. Danger Mouse is a hip-hop producer who created this thing called the Grey Album, right? He took Jay-Z's acapellas from the Black Album and he cut up the music from the Beatles' White Album and put them on top of each other. Now I ain't trying to see no highway chase with Jake. Plus I got a few dollars I could fight the case. So I pull over to the side of the road I heard. Son, do you know why I'm stopping you for? Cause I'm young and I'm black and my hat's real low. Do I look like a mind reader, sir? I don't know. Am I under arrest or should I get some more? Well, you ain't going 55 and the 54. The Grey album came out, there was, uh, uh, I think it was just a limited edition thing that was in some promo form. It was just supposed to be kind of fun. And somehow it, it got out further than they expected, came to the attention of uh, the record label, I believe, EMI. EMI uh, sent out all these cease and desist letters to uh, Danger Mouse and folks who were trading the album and really tried to squelch uh, the album altogether and to kind of stamp it out of existence. Any attempts to sample the Beatles, for example, uh, on the sound recording side are going to be very tricky to do and, and pretty much impossible to do. The Beatles actually in Revolution Number no. 9, it's a whole nine minutes of them using uh, a lot of stock uh, sound recordings into this new work. Number 9. Well, of course, EMI's lawyers got wind of it. EMI uh, controls the sound recordings to the White Album, and uh, EMI decided that the Grey Album shall be no more. What's interesting about the Grey Album is that the artist himself didn't seem to have any interest in, in trying to uh, protest this or, or see it as a point of, uh, of which to, to, to struggle or resist. It was really fans of the work. It was other people who were, cared about these issues that came in. They took the work and started posting it up online everywhere. Danger Mouse won, EMI lost. This album, if it were actually for sale, might have been one of the biggest hits of 2004. Another of the absurdities of the music industry is that nobody made a dime. Nobody made a dime from one of the most successful albums of 2004, and it didn't have to be that way. If we had a more rational system for dealing with samples, then perhaps somebody deserving would have been able to make a little bit of money off of this amazing phenomenon. But as it turned out, we still got to dance to it, and that was good. The ability now to mash up and create new songs, I guess, has really been facilitated by digital technologies, uh, where it kind of democratizes that process. You don't need to have a recording studio and lots of fancy equipment. You can basically do it just on your computer or in the privacy of your home with tools that are relatively easy to um, acquire. Sampling is the kind of technology that's really shifted the way that people consume uh, and produce culture. The consumers have become producers. It came out of the studios, the professional recording studios, and into the bedroom. And that, you know, changed the music industry to a large extent, and the reverberations of that are still going on.
what we do is remix video musically. We take videos, music, beats, and mix them all together into something new. It's just like composing with, like if you were to drum on pots and pans, you know? It's just finding out what sounds where, and then play them, you know? So you can just arrange them on your timeline, put them in the right place to make the right little rhythm or riff. Anything that can be put onto audio and video together is uh, fair game for us. You know, we don't have the backing of a label, um, so we're just out there in the world interacting pretty much directly with people. The way we exist is on the internet, and we operate almost immediate publishing of what we're doing on the internet. And we've received no cease and desist, and no person going, how dare you touch my content. It's never right. happened. What we do is so uh, transparent that it's a remix. You know, we're literally moving the video with our hands, we're dropping classical music over beats, you, and the speed and the, the way we mix it continuously means you couldn't mistake it for anything else. It is inevitably and, and ostensibly a remix. Oh, I don't see like what we're doing is like stealing because we're we're so obviously representing those acts. The whole point of what we do is that we sample. It's not some feature of what we do, it's all we do. Just totally illegal, insanely illegal, you know, and impossible to clear. It would be impossible to release what we release if you did it through legal channels. You know, it can only exist on the, and in the kind of mixtape form. I think hip hop producers, you know, have to be a lot more cautious than they were 25 years ago. I think they understand fully that ultimately they're going to pay the bill, right? At the end of the day, the sample clearance is going to come out of their pocket, you know? So I think that that's changed the way that producers think about how they put music together. Where I used to start a song was if I heard some shit on a record that I liked, I'm snatching it. And then that, and I'm starting there. Um, and but and now it's a little different. Now where I start is um, is a little more cautious. Maybe I was wrong with um, sampling of a beat, but my thing is that sometimes you can't put soul in a bottle. You can't quantify soul by by a person that just got a briefcase and just sits down and thinks that everything soulful is actually exclusive. As much as everyone else seems to have a problem with it, we're still doing it. We're still just 
getting on with it. And people are bringing out technology to help us the whole time. And now we work with the companies that make all the technology we use, you know? They invented the technology so that people like us could use it and have fun and make music and progress and move on. Wouldn't that be nice if we could just get on with it? Well, I mean, you have some kid in the Bronx with two turntables who could be the, the, a musical Einstein and has the genius idea for a record that could do 50 million copies and change the world. You can't do it. I think artists that sample that ignore copyright law are, are, are not in business. I mean, what, what about if that artist has a hit song and somebody else is going to sample their song? You know, it, what goes around comes around. There are rules of the game. There's a copyright. You have to get permission. You know, I can't go and walk on your, on your I can't walk in your house and just sit down on your couch and go to your refrigerator and take a glass of milk out. I mean, there are rules. I'm allowed to have an opinion on whether or not sampling is cool. And as it turns out, most of the time it isn't, you know, but I, I don't think we need to get the law involved, you know? I think the law is involved in way too many things already. The other thing that you see happening is, you know, sampling going back underground, like way underground. You know, for a bunch of artists who, you know, feel like, hey, I'm gonna be outlaw about it. You know, because sampling law has created two classes. You're either rich enough to afford the law, or you're a complete outlaw. If you can catch me, then I didn't do my job. Straight up, it's my fault. You know, it's just something that we definitely have to think about because we're looking at it at a level where, like, man, if we did get hit with something, what? You know, how, 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 how the hell are we gonna afford to really deal with it? You know, if you're using little pieces and 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 and, and little ahems from James Brown, or whatever, I think those should be like kind of like. Uh, giveaways I prefer to get a, a, my name on the record saying this is Clyde playing instead of the money is not the important thing just to get myself out in the world knowledgeable what my name is the more important I think ultimately it's up to every artist if they're gonna borrow something from somebody to pay respects to the persons that they borrowed it from that's how society moves forward it doesn't just invent new things it evolves through taking old things and changing them. Visit the Independent Lens website to learn more about music sampling and the people featured in the film. Connect with indie film fans and music lovers through your lens and share your thoughts in Talkback online at pbs.org. Nine-year-old Priscilla has passion and talent. Her single father, Jesse, dreams of stardom. Peace Star's first deal could be multi-million dollars. A family's journey through love, fortune, heartbreak, and fame. I'm Peace Star, yeah, I came to get down. Peace Star Rising on Independent Lens. Plus, I'm known to rip the microphone. Yeah, see more ice than a puck. I ain't your This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.